Thank you and, and uh, for coming to the webinar series from the Ioneer Foundation called Sight and Sound Bites. This bi-weekly webinar series uh, highlights the research at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Today's topic is taking a tour of the Skull Base Surgery Center, and you're really going to get a tour. <laughs> um, other um, webinars have been more of a presentation. This will be an actual tour that will be, um, you know, I think a very interesting thing be before COVID, we used to have a lot of tours where we would take people around and show you the labs. It's kind of what you're going to get today. And I think you'll appreciate it as it's very, very well done. I'm Lawton Snyder, CEO of the Ioneer Foundation. The Ioneer Foundation supports research to advance care for vision, hearing, balance, voice, and cancers of the head and neck at the two world-renowned departments of ophthalmology and otolaryngology at the University of Pittsburgh. The funds we provide from the Ioneer Foundation to support research only made possible because of philanthropic support. And I say that very genuinely, the support that we received to the foundation helps us get a lot of programs started like you're gonna hear about today. We've been supporting the, uh, the skull base team and a lot of their efforts for many years. So um, a few housekeeping things, uh, chat is uh, disabled for um, our webinars, but what we ask you to do is use the Q and A function. So when you have a question, just go ahead and click on the Q and A button type your question and, and we'll, um, we'll be able to get to that. We are gonna take questions and answers and answer questions at the end of the uh, program. Um, I'll come back on after um, uh, Dr. Gardner, Dr. Snyderman um, and, uh, and, and, and just read questions for them. So refrain from personal questions if possible, but we will get to all of those questions one way or the other, if we don't get them to them during the today's program, we can um, send you an email with any of the questions you may have. And then um, please feel free to use the subtitles, uh, the subtitle function for closed captioning at the bottom of your screen. And uh, if you need so to do so, and then we will send you a survey. So we appreciate surveys uh, as a way to continue to help us improve our programs. And then we will add you to our mailing list for future webinars. And I hope you appreciate that. And, um, and we will uh, continue to offer programs like this, as I said, every other week. So let me introduce today's, um, the, the features of today's program, and they, they're going to essentially introduce the program, which is actually, as I said, a video tour of the uh, Skull Base Labs. Uh, Carl Snyderman, uh, uh, Dr. Snyderman, uh, MD, MBA, Professor of Department of Otolaryngology and Professor of Department of Neuro, uh, Neurological Surgery, and Professor of Bioengineering at the Swanson School of Engineering, Vice Chair in Quality of Patient Safety, Co-Director of the Center for Cranial-Based Surgery. And he's joined by Dr. Paul Gardner, MD, who is the Peter J. Janetta Professor of the Department of Neuro uh, Neurological Surgery, and Executive Vice Chair of Surgical Services, Neurosurgical Director, Center for Cranial-Based Surgery, and Director of Surgical Neuroanatomy Lab. Uh, gentlemen, welcome and thank you for um, uh, presenting this program to us today and, and uh, look forward to it and look forward to answering questions at the end. Thank you. I'd like to welcome everybody. Um, uh, thank you so much for attending today's webinar. Uh, in case you attended our pr prior webinar describing what it is that we do, uh, this uh, today's pr uh, presentation will be much less graphic and uh, so don't, I hope no one's concerned. Um, but I want to thank everyone for their ongoing support. And so our goal today is to sort of share all the other things that we are doing with your support, uh, give you an overview of the, all of the different activities of the team. Uh, agree and thank you. And uh, hopefully you'll get more insight into uh, the efforts that, and uh, the uh, resources required for the research we do.
This is Dr. Paul Gardner here in the lab of Dr. Adna Hotri, who does a lot of our rare tumor research. Uh, we're going to look at some of the work that's being done here currently with Chordoma. Yeah, so uh, we're doing uh, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Paul Gardner and um, Dr. Kersey and Matthew Halbert, a PhD student in my lab, uh, the molecular genetics of Chordomas. We now live in an age where precision medicine and molecular biology dictates future treatments. And we're very excited about some of the discoveries that are being made uh, in collaboration here at UPMC and University of Pittsburgh and Dr. Gersey and Matthew are essentially working on using molecular genetics, kind of 23andMe, to decipher the uh, DNA code of Cordoma and then hopefully identify novel therapeutics that we can then test in the lab for promising signals and then hopefully move those into early phase clinical trials. So in addition to um, our Cordoma research with molecular genetics, uh, we have a lot of the lab looking at diet and nutrition and metabolism. So right now we're trying to figure out what these uh, rare tumors are using for fuel sources, uh, how are they using glucose and amino acids and proteins to feed themselves. And by understanding what tumor cells essentially eat, we can repurpose uh, clinically approved drugs to target their metabolism and their diet, thereby attacking them in a different approach. So. So these are incredible efforts you're doing here. This, you know, obviously a fully stocked lab, but how, how do you fund this? What, what pays for these efforts on, especially rare tumors like chordoma or other tumors like meningiomas or some of the pediatric tumors that you work on? That's a great question. So unfortunately the NIH only funds 2% of pediatric cancers in general. And we're very gracious to have some of our funded support through the NIH through R01 grants. Uh, a lot of it does uh, depend on philanthropic endeavors and uh, donations and a lot of uh, amazing foundation work. But as you can see, uh, running multiple projects and trying to find uh, new therapies and potentially cures requires a lot of funding. And you unfortunately spend a lot of your time really working on that funding effort rather than able to be here in the lab. Is that fair to say? That is very fair to say. All right, Dr. Gardner and Dr. Zonos here uh, to talk about the show our Neuroanatomy Lab. Uh, this is a lab we've had open now for uh, almost 20 years here at the University of Pittsburgh. As you can see here, we have a couple of our uh, fellows here working. These are anatomy fellows who are studying anatomy. They're both learning and training as well as they are developing and describing new anatomy. Uh, these are international fellows we have from all over the world and uh, domestically as well. This is really critical, it has helped us develop all the approaches that we've developed, as well as train literally thousands of other surgeons. This is our photogrammetry station. This is a pretty amazing, relatively new technology, but relatively simplistic. It uses digital software to uh, essentially recreate a three-dimensional model. You can see here we have a camera set up, a very simplistic setup where the uh, we can place an anatomic model and slowly rotate it to take uh, many, many pictures, the more pictures obviously the more detailed, uh, and 360 degrees around the model, and in doing so we can use the software to recreate a 3D virtual model. We can also do this with an endoscope, so we can use that to demonstrate, uh, create a virtual model for teaching, for education, even for publication uh, of all kinds of anatomy, help spread it even well beyond this small lab. So this is the final room for uh, our modest anatomy lab. Uh, we have both a 3D setup in here, so this is, you can see a couple of our fellows here discussing, discussing a, a three-dimensional uh, anatomy that they've dissected and created three-dimensional pictures of. Obviously, you have to have the right cameras on to be able to see it, but again, this is part of that technology, the photogrammetry, and part of how we study the anatomy. We also have a high-definition fiber tractography lab. This uh, high-end lab, this is our Jessica, our, um, our fellow. Uh, we use um, this uh, um, technology to understand how the different nerves, um, the neurons, uh, are coursing around tumors. So we know to stay away from, um, to stay out of harm's way when we're operating. We understand where the language centers are, where the vision centers are, uh, where the centers that allow us to move um, different parts of our body are and then understand exactly the relationship with the tumor so as to be able to develop a very accurate plan uh, and also know um, what to avoid when approaching these tumors. 
All right, so we're here in our clinic uh, in one of the exam rooms where we do some very intense clinical research looking at neurocognitive and neuropsychological outcomes of both tumors as well as our surgery and what the impact that has on neurocognitive function. This is something very innovative, believe it or not. Most people don't actually study the impact of, on cognition. We study things uh, such as, can I move my arm? Can I speak afterwards? But we don't study higher function, higher thinking function. Uh, our department actually has a neuropsychologist. And part of the research though, that we really are, uh, fund on a regular basis is examining neuropsychology before and after surgery in patients with brain or skull-based tumors. And this is Dr. Luke Henry, who's our uh, neuropsychologist who carries out all of this intensive testing for us. And, and Dr. Henry, if you can tell us some, some of what the testing that you do and some of the things you found. Absolutely, so as a part of my function as a neuropsychologist in the department, I try to get a broad-based assessment of all kinds of cognitive functions, uh, different kinds of memory, attention, uh, processing speed or how fast a person can think, uh, as well as their executive function, uh, which allows us to create a functional map, of you, if you will, of uh, your brain's um, ability to handle information. Uh, by taking more of a broad-based approach uh, and sampling different domains of cognition, uh, we're able to get a good idea for how you're doing before surgery and how the tumor or effects of the tumor may or may not be impacting your function. Um, so putting you through a battery of tests allows us to get a good idea uh, of what that functioning looks like. And, um, just an idea for some of what we can do. Um, for example, patients are presented with a target image and asked to copy that image. This gentleman uh, had a uh, meningioma pressing in the right uh, frontal temporal region. This is his copy of the image. The image is in front of him. This is after a three minute delay. And you can see there's significant disorganization and degrading of his function. And this is 25 minutes later, again, showing that same disorganized pattern with significant degradation of the original image. And by looking at these processes, uh, we were able to understand how the tumor might be impacting uh, his cognition. And we do this again, not just through this measure, but multiple measures across multiple cognitive domains uh, that allow us to have a more complete understanding of function. Believe it or not, this is not a standard part of testing for a patient with a brain tumor. Hi, I'm Dr. Carl Snyderman. I'm here with Benita Valapil. She is the Director of Research for the Skull Base Center. You know, one of the problems we have with skull base surgery is simply the, the diversity of the problems, the, the conditions that we deal with. There are at least 30 different tumor types that we encounter each with its own unique biologic behavior and a different treatment strategy. Um, so, you know, one of the most important uh, aspects of uh, improving the care of our patients is having a better understanding of the behavior of these tumors and testing new therapies. And so, you know, one institution, even though UPMC is a very busy place and we see lots of patients coming from all over, we do not have enough of all of these tumor types to really answer some important questions. And so that re requires collaboration with other institutions so that we can gather enough uh, information. So Benita, tell me about how we collaborate with other institutions and, and what kind of data do we share? Multi-institutional studies are fairly involved. Um, we do a lot of uh, things where we are collecting tissue, for example, on certain projects right now. Uh, these are very rare tumor types and we do a lot of specimen collection. It entails storing the specimens. Um, there's shipping of these specimens involved. And finally, I think one of the most costly endeavors associated with that is analyzing these tissues. So there's a significant amount of cost involved in conducting assays. Now, Benita, a lot of your time is spent collecting data on our own mm -hmm. patients, and this right. goes into a computer file. Mm -hmm. um, what is a tumor registry and, and what is the purpose of that? So the uh, purpose behind that is essentially to document um, all of the clinical data that we collect on these patients. 
um, as well as all of the banking that we do with the patients. And then ultimately these registries then allow us to conduct a lot of studies where we have a lot of data that enables us to target different types of research projects that will in essence also help us learn about the different tumor types. At, at the time of surgery, we often collect tissue mm -hmm. from patients, mm -hmm. part of their tumor that's removed, and we put that into a tissue bank. Can mm -hmm. you explain what is a tissue bank and why is that such a valuable resource? So the tissue bank is a contract that we set up in-house. And again, we have this with multi-institutional sites as well. This is where we are able to collect this precious specimens. So we have currently three studies, for example, with chordoma patients, um, patients that are going through sinonasal malignancies those that have chondrosarcomas. So these are very rare, very precious specimens. So the tumor bank will bank specimens for us, whether they're flash frozen, fresh tissue, um, they also bank blood for us. So these specimens then we are able to either conduct studies internally or have them sent to a repository where we can have studies done nationwide. So this is a very, very precious resource. Well, thank you for your time. It's uh, We really could not advance the, the science of our uh, specialty without the involvement of people such as Benita that help us uh, collect the data and, and the samples that we need for our studies. Thank you. Thank you. So this uh, is an example of one of our study uh, databases. This one in particular is for our Corsica study. Um, that is a study where we follow patients with primary sinonasal malignancy long term to study their outcomes. Um, and as you can see on this screen, this is where we track their progress and their longitudinal um, data sets. And then we finally take the information from here and it's transposed over to the REDCap database, which is a HIPAA compliant database. Um, this is a multi-institutional database that allows other sites to also enter their data. Um, each site is protected for their own data entry. We currently have uh, seven sites that are taking part in this study with Stanford being the coordinating site. Um, in addition to this study, we also have tissue collection and blood, blood specimens that we collect from this protocol, which is associated with another study that we're working with, Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania. That's CHOP, and this is where it's a repository where we bank all of these priceless, rare tissue samples. A um, lot of universities are contributing their samples to this repository in hopes of finding treatment and cure for these very rare tumor types. Hello, my name is David, and I was diagnosed with sinonasal undifferentiated carcinoma. <clears throat> It began last August of 2020 with nosebleeds uh, that became more and more frequent and more increasingly difficult to stop. I went to my local ENT doctor and he almost immediately set up an appointment with Dr. Lee and Dr. Wong at Ioneer Institute in Pittsburgh, <clears throat> and whom, whom he had recently met at a conference. From my first visit with Dr. Wong, the wisdom of this referral became, became very apparent to me. My first surgery in September of 2020 involved debulking and biopsy of the tumor, followed by a treatment plan of chemotherapy and radiation. I had a follow-up, I had follow-up scans <clears throat> and another surgery in April of this year and presently am on a treatment plan of chemo and immunotherapy combination. I have been so impressed at how informed Dr. Wong is about my type of cancer and I have great confidence in him and his entire team. From the beginning, he was upfront with <clears throat> my prognosis, treatment plan, and expectations with my wife and myself. Also, he presents all information in a way that is easy to understand and absorb. I believe that Dr. Wong's research has brought my, <clears throat> has benefited my prognosis and my progress to date, and I am very grateful. Thank you. As you can see from that last patient testimonial, 
Sinonasal malignancy has a significant impact on people's quality of life, and we're fortunate at the UPMC Center for Cranial-Based Surgery to be considered world leaders in the management of these difficult malignancies. In fact, um, some of the earliest work in using the endoscopic and nasal approach for the management of these tumors was done here, proving that even malignant disease can be successfully managed using these techniques. However, these are very rare diseases, um, and even a single center has a hard time accumulating enough information to provide meaningful results for both the patients in regards to their oncological outcomes, as well as what it means for their quality of life. We have partnered together with uh, other leading universities to both um, study quality of life, the outcomes from the cancers themselves, as well as to provide a robust tumor bank for next generation sequencing to help us understand the challenges and the molecular changes that occur in these tumors. Here we actually could very much value and utilize the support that you could provide. The banking of tumors um, is actually quite an expensive process for us to maintain um, these cryopreserved samples. And then as we begin to accumulate adequate numbers of these among uh, both UPMC and other institutions, we can embark on very uh, powerful next generation sequencing studies, similar to what we've done in uh, clivocordoma, to help us understand the prognostic factors associated with this, as well as understand new treatment outcomes. Unfortunately, this also is a very costly process and not one that is largely sponsored by government agencies. As we move forward with this, we're very much dependent upon grateful patients and individuals like you to help us continue this important um, work on a rare tumor. Thank you again for your support. Something else that we're very excited about is the development of this molecular prognostication panel for this uh, tumors that arise from the base of the skull and for which uh, uh, the University of Pittsburgh's a referral center uh, from around the world, uh, these tumors called chordomas. They're quite rare. And for the longest of time, we had no idea how to differentiate um, the tumors that uh, were more benign from the tumors that were more aggressive. So we essentially treated all the tumors the same. But with a, a, a collaborative effort among pathology and many other people here at UPMC, uh, we've been able to come up with this um, molecular prognostication panel that was presented recently and, and published and actually um, had won an award. Um, and uh, with this molecular prognostication panel, uh, we're able actually now to individualize care and actually uh, create guidelines about how each tumor should be treated based on, on the molecular characteristics of the tumor. Jinri, it's been uh, a little while since we saw you, but uh, I can't believe now it's been almost four years or it's been four years since your surgery. Um, can you tell me about your experience leading up to that, finding out uh, how you found out about the tumor and how you felt about that? Well, it was just one day that my mom found out that I kind of like look at things with my head slanted. So she tried to like bend my head back. But then I start to see double vision when she do, do that. So we went to a hospital and took an MRI like on my, like my head area and found out that there was like a tumor in my head. You know, we were able to fortunately do an endoscopic endonasal complete removal, including getting, you know, negative margin. So really complete, really radical removal. And now a lot of times the standard treatment is uh, radiation after as part of treating chordoma. We, we had done this large study, Dr. Zanonos did looking at all of our chordoma patients um, and understanding from looking at all these chordoma patients that actually some of them don't need radiation with a complete removal. If they don't have a lot of genetic mutations, then maybe they don't need radiation. And for someone young like you, who then was just going to go through puberty and hopefully a whole life ahead of you, um, not getting radiation, a high dose of radiation in that area could make a big difference. Uh, I remember um, when I looked at your pathology and I saw it didn't have the mutations, how happy I was to be able to tell you this because I was hoping if anyone could benefit from this. And, and that's been four years now, is that right, Jinri? Yeah, four years. How, how have you been feeling? How have you been doing? I don't really feel anything now that after the surgery, I feel like 
it's pretty normal and not that much difference compared to like before I had the surgery. That's that's wonderful. I'm I really appreciate you taking the time to tell me your story. I uh, you know it's so rewarding for us to be able to develop these surgeries and then even do the research to understand how do we best treat someone like you and to watch you grow up is is I can't tell you what a reward that is. So thanks again for taking the time to do this and and uh, tell your story for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, this is Carl Snyderman. I'm here with jo Joanne Husovsky. Uh, she runs our free educational skull base website, skullbasecongress.com. And so we're uh, here today just to talk about uh, the website and uh, what services it provides and, and what value it provides for the greater skull base community. Uh, hi, Joanne. Um, what can you tell us about the website? Carl, you know, um, of course, we've been working with the website now since 2016 and just recently went on to a new platform. And it's been going strong ever since 2016. That's five years now. And we still continue to gain new members every month. There are new members joining. So we're now up to almost 2000 members. It's free. It's global. It's available 24-7. Um, it offers everything in the niche world of skull base. Uh -huh. And what, what kind of content are, are people most interested in? What do they like to see on the website? Clearly cases in anatomy far outweigh anything. Cases, they just love it. And where are most of our members from? Most are still from the U.S. Um, and that includes, of course, visiting scholars from overseas. But then we have, we have, obviously globally, we have them from India, China, Brazil, Israel, Taiwan, Japan, Canada, Italy, and Mexico. That's our top, big top ten. Well, great, Joanne. Uh, we certainly couldn't do this without your help, uh, and it's greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, this is Carl Snyderman. I'm here with uh, two engineering students, Lauren Grice and Garrett Craig. Uh, they're working with me on an invention that we've uh, made, and this is a new type of endotracheal tube. This is the breathing tube that's put down the throat of people at the time of surgery or if someone needs to go on a ventilator in, in the intensive care unit. This is the kind of, of tube that's used. Uh, here is a standard tube uh, showing a, a balloon cuff on the end. And our innovation is to replace that with baffles, soft, flexible baffles. And we're going to show you why that's so important. Okay. So here we have a balloon cuff that traditional cuff tube in a clear tube representing the trachea and here is one of our baffle prototypes and we're going to compare how much fluid they leak. Okay. And the fluid leaking is just going to be represented by this green dye. So, we'll so one of the problems with having a breathing tube in your throat is that secretions in the throat can drip into the lungs and cause a pneumonia and this has about a 30 percent or more mortality rate when that happens. And you can imagine during the COVID pandemic, there were an increased number of patients on ventilators. And even if they survived the COVID, they often died from pneumonia. So pretty dramatic difference. And this is just one example of how we work with engineering students here at the University of Pittsburgh to develop uh, our ideas and create prototypes like this. And uh, we have a provisional patent pending and are working towards getting this product to market. Here at the Center for Cranial Based Surgery, one of our greatest investments of time has been the prospect of trials studying patients' quality of life. As we approach skull-based tumors, there's always a consequence to the pathways that we take. So here's a good example of a 3D model that's been made for a patient 
with a large olfactory groove uh, malignancy. And what you can see is how this tumor uh, is delicately and intricately entwined between the orbit um, in the sense of olfaction on the very roof of the nose and the consequences of sacrificing these structures using endoscopic anal approaches has been a, a large area of investigation for us for quite a long time. Unfortunately, these kinds of trials are not often supported by government funds, but they're very important to patients themselves. And so we've made a huge investment in understanding quality of life, both in terms of olfaction, the consequences for sinonasal um, morbidity from endoscopic approaches, and how patients do in general um, from these kinds of surgeries. And we think this has provided very valuable information, and we'd really appreciate your continued support in helping us to conduct these studies moving forward. As you can see, there are a huge number of efforts that we're making for skull-based surgery to advance both clinical and research. Thank you for your time and support. Okay, so we are back, and um, and uh, thank you, one, thank you, Paul, and uh, and uh, Dr. Gardner, Dr. Uh, Snyderman, for um, for taking the time to put this together. I, I tell you that um, again, you know, this was always something we look forward to doing with people as they come to visit, and um, and actually provided a very in depth uh, tour as well as even some additional opportunities to hear from patients directly. I found some of that fascinating um, and congratulations uh, um, to the team for some of the work that you're doing for those patients. Uh, it was certainly great to hear how the personalized medicine approaches that you used for the young lady who, um, who was able to avoid having radiation therapy certainly um, would improve her quality of life because you were able to identify from a personalized medicine approach those you know, the type of tumor that she had, that's just fantastic. These are all the things we're hoping to accomplish, as you can tell. I see questions coming in. Um, I don't know if you, if, if, uh, before we get to the questions, uh, Dr. Snyder, Dr. Gardner, anything to add following uh, our video before we get started with the questions? I'll sort of dovetail on the comment that you made. And uh, I think that was part of the idea behind showing that is uh, that genuinely was something we were able to apply immediately to patients that came from research from philanthropic support. Um, our ability to uh, store the specimens, our ability to uh, do pathological research on the specimens, our ability to even do the data harvesting and the, uh, and, and the data mining that's necessary to understand uh, results on a large set of patients with a large amount of genetic data is what provides that ability to instantly turn around and start applying that to patients to make a difference for them. Um, we have the unique ability as uh, uh, clinicians with a fair amount of experience to understand where the challenges are and where we don't do as well with our types of tumors. And then uh, the difficulty then becomes making sure that we answer those questions. And that's really the goal of uh, all of this in the end. Yeah, I'd like to reiterate that this is really a team effort. There are a lot of people working behind the scenes uh, collaboratively to, to advance the, the knowledge, the, the expertise in, in our specialty. Um, and uh, it's really not the effort of any single individual. It's, it's, it's all of us working together. Well, it, it really is a tremendous team. And, you know, again, something that Pittsburgh really, um, you know, has that's very unique and, 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 and really we should, uh, we should cherish. Thank you. So um, we have some, uh, some questions already said, uh, I really enjoyed seeing the pictures of the patient, uh, the pictures that the patient drew prior to surgery and timed intervals. This type of pre-surgical assessment requires an intricate level of coordination of care. Would you expand on the process that the Scalby Surgery Fellows across otolaryngology and neurology to help patients both pre and post surgery? Yeah, I mean, uh, it is, uh, it's a lot of communication, uh, both otolaryngology and neurosurgery have our own schedulers. And so it requires a, a lot of communication between them. We've, um, uh, done our best to make sure we have clinics on the same days so that we can, uh, see patients in those settings. Uh, but it really is our, our group of coordinators and nurses who facilitate that process. And, um, you know, I give a lot of credit to our neuropsychologists and to, our department for uh, ensuring that we can support neuropsychologists as part of our 
uh, research process. It's it. Uh, I think it really is the next uh, level of neurosurgical care. Is you know we say we only understand maybe 10% of the brain function. And I think that's not uh, that we don't use that other 90%, it's that we don't fully understand that circuitry. And one of the first steps really is, is testing it in order to study it. So that's a, a critical part of it. Um, and uh, funding for neuropsychology and neuropsychology research, especially, I think is a, an entirely new frontier. That's terrific. So maybe this is kind of related. So does Dr. Henry do all the cognitive testing himself or do you use, does he use other staff to assist? If there are others, what level of education experience do these staff have? Uh, he, he does the majority of himself. We do actually have a second neuropsychologist as well who, who takes part. Um, there uh, are some, um, I guess, more rote tests that can be handed out to patients that they can follow themselves. Uh, when we use, uh, when we use uh, predetermined platforms like that, for example, <clears throat> on an iPad, we have a, a proposal where we might be able to study that on an iPad and reach even more, a greater number of patients because uh, that this question is very savvy in that it points out this limits the number of patients you can test if it requires a neuropsychologist doing it. So we have medical staff assistants who uh, might be able to, for example, hand out iPads and collect them, things like that. Um, and their training is uh, enough to do things like IVs or or take vital signs, but uh, not full nursing training. Okay, well, thank you. So uh, what are the greatest needs of the Skull Base Center uh, program right now and how can an individual support? We, we appreciate those questions for sure <laughs> coming to us from the foundation. Um, Who would like to answer that? Well, I'd be happy to, uh, I think both of us can answer that, but um, it really depends on the perspective of the individual. We all have our sort of pet projects and, and, and special interests. But I would say that data collection is probably most important. Um, people don't realize how uh, labor intensive it is to collect all of the, the data um, regarding um, uh, patient treatment and their outcomes, uh, the pathology, radi radiology, et cetera. And this requires uh, really having full-time uh, personnel to, to uh, see the patients, enroll the patients in studies, get the data, uh, share the data, um, track the specimens. And, and that's a very expensive uh, activity as well. And, and that probably is a limiting factor for most institutions is they simply don't have the time and personnel to collect that data and that limits uh, what we can learn from our patients. Um, um, so I, I think you know, that would be number one. And then you know, that's sort of on the patient side of things. And then I would also argue that on the training side of things, there's a similar need to understand uh, how do we train surgeons to do this surgery more effectively. Um, we're doing uh, um, some very novel research in the lab that we didn't discuss today, where we are actually studying surgeons while they're performing uh, endoscopic surgical tasks. And we're measuring brain waves at the, doing brain imaging at the time of these tasks. We're doing neurocognitive testing of our surgeons and really trying to tease out what are the special uh, neurocognitive skills that are essential for processing complex visual information, uh, for navigating uh, in this uh, tight space uh, using these instruments. And that will help us develop more effective training methods for the next generation of surgeons. Paul, your comments? Yeah, I, th I think if you, if you look at this video, you realize that the research has many different spokes to it. Um, and there is a common hub that unites that research, and that's our research coordinator. Uh, you saw Benita there. Uh, that's a salaried position. Uh, she uh, is highly experienced, highly trained, and highly educated uh, to perform her tasks. This is something that many centers do not have. Um, she handles all of our uh, institutional reviews, which ensure that our studies are uh, meet uh, ethical standards and are reviewed by the university. That's an incredibly time intensive uh, um, process to go through and requires actually quite a bit of experience to handle seamlessly what she's able to do. She also tracks all of our studies. Uh, she tracks all of our uh, tumor samples. She tracks all of the patients who are being studied. You can imagine the amount of uh, information that's being uh, funneled through that into the different studies. Now, so that's probably one of the primary needs that keeps our program going. And that's simply not a position that's funded by any medical center or uh, by any university. Uh, each individual uh, grant or, or study has to be able to find some way to try to fund that aspect of it. Um, when you look at the individual spokes, 
Uh, I think it depends a little bit on the spoke where, where the cost is. When you look at training and anatomy research, which I think sometimes is undervalued because uh, the direct return on that is not so obvious, but the truth is that all of the approaches that we've developed came out of that anatomy lab. It came from studying the anatomy and being able to practice and study there. And the costs there are, you know, the cost of the space, the cost of the specimen, the cost of the tools, and all of that adds up really very quickly. And then if you look at some of the genetic research that's being done, the cost of genetic sequencing has dropped dramatically. But even so, if you look at the cost of looking at the genome, for example, for a single tumor, you're still looking at several thousand dollars, not to mention the cost of lab space, et cetera. So the work that you saw Dr. Agnihotri do is completely supported by grant funding and really does uh, require those kind of efforts. So I think it, it depends a little bit. There's the overall picture. Uh, and I would argue that that's perhaps the most important. That's the research coordinator. But if there are individual aspects of the research that really uh, strike home for someone, I think those are those each have their own individual costs and um, uh, needs. Thank you very much. So the long history of the skull-based surgery program in Pittsburgh was discussed briefly at the beginning of the video. Please exp expand on the history of this dynamic and great program. Well, that's always one of my favorite topics. I'm very <clears throat> proud of the legacy of the University of Pittsburgh in skull-based surgery. Uh, this remains uh, not only a pioneering center, but the preeminent center in the world for doing this kind of work. And it all started back in the 1970s with two pioneering surgeons, uh, Dr. Joseph Maroon from neurosurgery and, and Eugene Myers from otolaryngology. And they did the first, performed the first, I would say, modern skull-based surgery uh, at the University of Pittsburgh, and really were the, the nucleus for putting together a skull-based uh, center uh, with the contributions of others, such as Lolligan Shaker from neurosurgery, um, and Evo Jonica from otolaryngology. And uh, I've been very fortunate to be part of that center from the beginning. I was the first uh, fellow uh, trained at the center and we had the first skull-based center in all of North America, one of the first in the world. And um, so there have been sort of two major paradigm shifts in skull-based surgery and Pittsburgh has been at the forefront of both of those paradigm shifts. The first one was really developing sort of big open skull base approaches, taking apart the, the face and the, and the cranium to get the deep, the deep hard to, to reach spots. And then with the introduction of endoscopes uh, in the uh, late 1980s, um, really we transitioned to doing everything endoscopically, working through the nose, and we really pioneered those techniques and continue to evolve. We're, we're continuing to develop new surgical approaches, new techniques. Um, you know, um, you may have heard us talk about before. Uh, we just recently pioneered a new approach through the through the sinuses to reach the brain for the treatment of temporal lobe epilepsy. Uh, working with neurosurgical uh, colleagues who specialize in epilepsy surgery, we've demonstrated a, a new way of removing damaged brain tissue with sparing of normal tissue. Um, so we continue to to advance uh, uh, skull based surgery. Um, in, in recognition of the pioneering efforts of uh, doctors uh, uh, Myers and Maroon, uh, we are in the middle of a fundraising a campaign for a, a Myers and Maroon chair in cranial-based surgery, which will be uh, used to fund these general efforts, uh, such as supportive personnel to carry on the important activities that we talked about. Great, thank you. And, and I, <laughs> I'll take this question. It says, if we want to help support these efforts, how can we do so? Well. Um, and essentially, that's what one of the functions of the INR Foundation. One of the areas that we support, of course, is the skull based surgery program. Uh, it's also supported through philanthropic donations through the Department of Neurosurgery directly. So uh, we sort of handle the otolaryngology um, connections, and the neurosurgery side is handled by my uh, colleague, who I believe is on this as well, is uh, Justin Meyer from the um, University of Pittsburgh's ne and, uh, Neurosurgery uh, Center. So we're, we're very. Um, um, you know, easy to find and easy to contact. It would be myself or Heather Cronus from the Ioneer Foundation. To, and, uh, and certainly you can find all of our information about how to give connected to your, uh, your link today. Um, is data collection from patients uh, voluntary? And if yes, what percentage of the patients allow you to collect data? So uh, interesting question. You know, the number one goal when we do any this research is protecting patient uh, data. And so one of the very, not, not one of the very first steps, the first step in collecting data is to do what we call de-identification. 
So someone might be assigned a number which has nothing to do with a medical record number or social security number or date of birth or anything like that. And their data is then placed into that repository where they can't be identified from it. One of the roles that can uh, that Benita can sometimes play is also to officially de-identify uh, someone. So there is sort of a firewall placed in that in that setting. So in that way, to some degree, some of the data is not voluntary. However, a fair amount of the research we do, when you look at, for example, tumor collection or uh, any of the more in-depth collections that we do, um, that is entirely voluntary. Uh, I find that patients are usually uh, most willing uh, and very grateful and, and we're and very gracious about it. And we're, um, I'm kind of honored that they allow us to use their, their tissue and their tumors to study uh, because it may not help them directly, but they know it'll help other people with the exact same diseases that they have. And I think I can say that more and more confidently the more we do this, that by uh, using this data and using this tissue, we're able to really further our field in pretty dramatic ways. And I think that's been borne out through the history of this center. Uh, and I think um, the, all the research we have currently has the ability to uh, further it even more. Terrific. So you mentioned, I think this is you, uh, Dr. Schneiderman, surgical cognition. So please elaborate on what surgical cognition is. Sure. So this is a special interest of mine. You know, how, why are some people just naturally good surgeons and others struggle? Um, and how can we improve their ability to, to train to a level of competence? And, um, you know, it takes years to become a master surgeon. And, and it's a very incremental process. We really don't really understand all the things that happen as you become an expert surgeon. But, you know, I can look at a surgical field with a novice surgeon and see things that they don't see. We're looking at the same tissues. We have the same visual information, but I'm extracting different information from that, from that view. And it's, it's really about pattern recognition. It's, it's how do you process visual information? And so this sort of gets into a, a, another area of, of research called visual cognition. And so we're in the process of establishing a unique center uh, that uh, studies visual cognition uh, in surgery to try to develop better training and learning methods. Um, and uh, for example, uh, we have a, a st ongoing study uh, with Lumosity Labs using their brain games, and we're testing medical students and residents um, to see what aspects of your brain function, uh, is it your ability to to um, uh, uh, react quickly or to switch t between different tasks or to problem solve or to um, some visual attribute. Um, and which of these domains is a better, best predictor of your ability to do endoscopic surgery. And so once we finish that phase of the study, then we can start training people in those areas to see if it enhances their surgical abilities. We're also just starting um, uh, studies looking at the brain flow or uh, looking at oxygen flow in the brain during the, the midst of, of surgical tasks. Um, we can put on these skull caps with little uh, LEDs embedded in the cap um, and they shine infrared light through the bone into the brain and then look at the light that's uh, reflected and they can actually measure how much oxygen different parts of your brain are using. And so while performing surgical tasks, we can see which parts of the brain are activated. We can compare a novice surgeon to an expert surgeon to see how they use different parts of their brain differently. Mm -hmm. We can measure how much stress interferes with the ability to perform surgery. Um, you know, how much, what, what we call cognitive load, how much excess capacity do you have for problem solving during complex surgeries? So we're just at the beginning of these types of studies but our goal is to really develop a unique state-of-the-art uh, surgical cognition laboratory at the University of Pittsburgh that will be at the forefront of developing uh, the best uh, training and teaching methods for this type of surgery. And I think those efforts have uh, a long reach even beyond training, which obviously our ability to understand thinking helps us become better educators. Uh, but also when you look at applying robotics to a lot of surgery, uh, a robot's not going to take over surgery. It's not going to take over all of the tasks of surgery, but there may be individual things that a robot can uh, do under, under the uh, supervision of a, of a uh, surgeon that, would allow, that can be done better by a machine than by a human being. And I think part of understanding surgical cognition is understanding also how you fit those tasks into 
the overall framework of a surgery uh, and improve what we're doing. And I think robotics is a key part of, of what we'll add to that. And, and this is really going to be a collaborative research effort with the Department of Ophthalmology. Um, you, working with visual scientists, we're sort of integrating two dis disciplines to really investigate this area that others haven't done before. Fascinating uh, all the way around. And uh, thank you. This, uh, this program is always fun to talk about because it obviously impacts patients. Every patient that I've met that you've, um, that you've helped is incredibly grateful because they, they realize they came someplace where they have the very best of care, but also that innovation and advancement of care is really um, looked at very, um, is at the forefront of what you're trying to do and what you're really pushing forward with your efforts. And I think we heard a lot about that today and it was really well done. So thank you so much. Uh, that's the end of our questions. And um, if there aren't any more, we'll, uh, we'll wrap things up, let everybody get back to lunch or what other things you're doing. And uh, thank you for attending and look forward to having you uh, come to more of our programs in the future. But uh, thank you again for all of your help and support and, and um, the gentlemen, uh, have a great day.